Hey, welcome to another episode of the Black Guy Who Tips podcast. I'm your host, Rod. Joined as always by my co-host, Karen. And we are live on a Wednesday. No, Tuesday? Wednesday. 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 We're live on a Wednesday. Of the week. <laughs> we had MLK Day off, guys. I'm, I'm one day off, okay? Right. Uh, we're live on a Wednesday. Um, and we're not alone. We have a very special guest. Uh, first time being on the program, but mm-hmm. if you've been on the internet, you probably already heard of him. Yes. Uh, today's guest is media personality, influencer, entrepreneur, and author of the brand new book, Get the Fuck Out of Your Own Way, A Guide to Letting Go of the Shit That's Holding You Back on Sale Right Now, Wherever You Get Books. It's MJ Harris. What's going on? I am happy to be here. I'm actually in Bangkok right now visiting with one of my nephew's son so it's nighttime in here it's like what time is it it is five o'clock in the morning uh, what here <laughs> oh my god uh first of all thank you for being here thank you baby i don't do anything at five in the morning <laughs> <laughs> oh wow um so like you're in bangkok uh karen was telling me earlier you, you went to Af- you living in africa now like uh, what, what's going on with all this globe trotting it and like how, how'd you get into that you know, I was never a big traveler. I didn't have the money to travel when I was growing up or anything like that. And then once I started working, I was more focused on just making enough money to pay back my student loans and pay my bills. So traveling wasn't a priority to me. And then once, um, you know, COVID hit and everything like that, and I was stuck in the house with no choice of going anywhere, I started to think about, do I really want to just, when the world opens up, what do I want to do? You know, you fans about size, about all the stuff you're going to do. And right. I was living in California. It was so expensive. Inflation was happening. It was like, I want a lower cost to live in. All the stuff that was happening around race. I was like, I wouldn't mind living someplace where my brown skin is treated a little bit nicer every mm. now and then. And so that led me to watching all these YouTube videos about different places that you can live in the world. Like, where could you live for under $1,500 a month? I, just, I was going like, oh, that looks fun. That seems nice. And it led me down this path of exploring options, which led me to initially Indonesia. I lived in Bali for six months. Um, and then um, I made South Africa my home after that, which is, you know, where I live. I live in um, South Africa. Yeah. Wow. And, and I think for me, I took a trip to Jamaica, a week long trip to Jamaica. And for the and I tell people for the first time ever. I we went days literally without seeing a white person and. It, 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 it'll throw you off. It like, does, yeah. but not trying for particularly when you live somewhere, the white country of America, it's, it's odd to be somewhere and, and you're not, you're the majority and not the minority. Mm-hmm. And I, for the first time in my life, not that I would do it, but I was like, this is why people move to places that are brown. This is why people move to places where people look like them. So you could just walk and you can just be and you can just exist. Not yeah. that, you know, racism and things, interpersonal things don't happen, but 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 the mind frame is a little different if you don't have that worry kind of around you all the time. Yeah, what? you know, for me, I lived in the suburbs of L.A., um, and then we lived in the neighborhood, maybe about 20 different houses in the neighborhood. And we were the only house that was any form of a minority, right? You know, doesn't matter. Just we were the only minority um, there. And I remember with my nephews who I raised as my sons, you know, I would not let them go out and jog with a hoodie on if it was dark out. I would make them, if you went, if you went to go, you know, to like, the, cause like a little community basketball court, if you want to go down there, take the dog, Max, these big old pit bulls. I'm like, nobody's going to fuck with you if the dog is there. And I had to train them about when you're driving, keep your, um, was it keep your wallet on the dashboard? Cause if you pulled over, you can just grab it easily. And so all these different things that was such a norm to me growing up. And I'm like, I'm instilling, an, I'm taking generational trauma and passing it on to them. And right. so for me, I started thinking about, you know, where could be a location that they could experience where, yes, they'll deal with the normal challenges of growing up, just growing into adulthood. That's a challenging experience. But can we at least remove one of those challenges? Yeah. Right. And so, um, that's what I've experienced by living um, in South Africa. Yeah. And I know like South Africa has its own like racial history and whatnot. Yeah. Um, 
Although they had a much better reckoning than America did, you know, <laughs> like at least they had like some some meetings, you know. Our stuff is still like some acknowledgement. The, that, hey, yeah. we 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 kind of messed up a little bit, you know. Yeah, they always putting our shit on the agenda. Like, oh, we gonna get to it. The next president, we are gonna get to it. We got y'all though. Um, but yeah, I have never thought about that of just like living in a world where you don't have to give like your kid to talk, you know? Because I feel like in America, I mean, you, you almost feel irresponsible as a black parent. To not give them the talk, and then you also feel like pressure of like I don't want to ruin your childhood, right? Uh, and living somewhere else, maybe you don't have to worry about that pressure. I could, that that has to feel very free. It is really nice, you know. So um, when I when I'm in when I'm at home in South Africa, people ask me all the time, "Why did you move here?" And I say, "Well, you know, I just I like it here. I like the quality of life. I like the cost of living." I say, and also um, as a black person, I do feel safer sometimes. And they say, really? And the, the number one response I hear consistently, are they still doing that stuff in America around race? And I was like, well, it can happen. You know, they said, so that stuff we see online is real. They're in disbelief. Right. Of the experience. And I say to them, I say, well, what you see online is just what was filmed. Their are experiences that people have every day. They never make it on camera. And so, you know, they don't, but they don't understand that because in a lot of cases, they see, they believe that we've transcended a lot of these things and that's just not the case in some cases yeah I, it's interesting too because like uh i feel like racism is probably america's number one export so i it, it's like it's interesting to see the disconnect because you know obviously they're getting the propaganda from america that's like no we had a black president it's cool guys mm -hmm. we solved everything but yeah i feel like you know with george floyd and and that being becoming like an international thing you have people protesting in countries that weren't even american and stuff um, and then also I feel like white people have been telling us to go back to Africa for so long that it's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, I, they should be expecting us to arrive. That's all I'm saying. They should, so, <laughs> they should be like, oh, okay, we already know what it is. Your house is over here. We got, we got y'all, got your Airbnb. Um, but you know, there are a lot of white people in South Africa, like, especially in Cape Town. Um, there's a lot of them. I think that's one of the things that shocks a lot of people when they come there is they think they're like, this doesn't look like what I thought it would look like. It's very modern. But also, there it's very, very racially diverse. You know, there are times where, depending on where I'm at, I could be in a space and I may be the only black person there. And then there's spaces where it's all black people. So right. South Africa reminds me of America from that perspective that it's extremely diverse, extremely yeah. diverse. Um, is it also, uh, you were talking about the cost of living. Is it like, do you feel like you're balling over there or you just feel like, cool, I can survive finally? Well, you know, for me, I feel like it, it depends, right? Because it's just like America, you know, someone who's living in, say, Montgomery, Alabama, has a very different living experience in terms of cost of living compared to someone who's living in the suburbs of L.A., right? So same in South Africa. It depends on where you choose to stay. Mm -hmm. I will say that for me, I feel like my money goes further there. Uh, my nephews who are, you know, one is 21 and the other one is 20, you know, they both sell insurance as a way to support themselves. And they feel like, you know, they, they both told me when we moved in, like, well, this is really nice. You know, um, the, an Uber is only $3 compared to in America where it would been $10, depending on where they were yeah. going. So I don't know that I'm going to say I feel like I'm living like a king or something like that there. Right. But I do definitely feel like my money goes further. And another thing is I have the peace of mind to be able to say no sometimes. I mm. felt like in a lot of cases before I moved, I would say yes to every little opportunity because although I make a quote unquote good living, I also take care of people in my house, out of my house. My business got bills. And if you're a business owner, the money goes up, down, up, down. And so there were times where for months and months at a time, I couldn't save a penny. You know, because I got to take care of everybody and everything. And so to me, I was, I finally been in a position in my life where if I want to say, no, I don't want to take on that opportunity. I can afford to say no, because my living expenses are far more manageable now. Yes, I feel you. How do you deal with, when you go to other parts of the world, language barriers? Because I know for a lot of people, that can be a big thing. It goes, I'm not going nowhere and I don't understand the language. <laughs> I'm dealing with that right now. So I'm visiting with my nephew and he is the, he is very calm. He doesn't party, doesn't drink, doesn't do anything like that. And so he chose to live in a distant, distant suburb of Bangkok where nothing is in English. No one speaks English. The, the menus, even when you go into the apps to order food, we use an app called Grab here. It's like Uber Eats, but nothing is in English. And so I am continuously like, I don't know what to do. 
you know, so I, I don't know what to do. I just try to guess at what the food is. And so um, for me, Google Translate helps a lot, you know, because okay. you can speak it and then read it out. And so that helps a great deal. Um, and what I found is that for the most part, people are very accommodating and try to help you. You know, pointing right. and gesturing can take you really far. So um, it's not as challenging as you would think, but I'm not going to say that it's easy either. And then also, um, you've been doing this for 10 years, like uh, online influence, all this stuff, talking. What was the, like, how'd you get your start? What was the, like, what was the transition from like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, I'm like everybody's cool friend that, that they're like, you know, oh. Oh man, this person, you should you should do stand up or something. And then one day you were like, actually, I am gonna start doing something. You know, I don't want to age myself because it's been a bit longer than 10 years of okay. a bit on. Um, but I will say this: what got me started was my ex-boyfriend. Uh, but he was in the record industry. I'm very introverted. People don't believe that because when I'm in my persona on camera, you know, they see something different, but I'm extremely introverted, very shy. And um, and so with him, he was the extrovert. And when we would be at home, you know, in the evening, we'd be smoking and talking. And, you know, when you smoke, you had all these philosophical ideas. And then I would just talk about different ideas. I was funny. I'd tell jokes and everything. And I knew I was funny all along. So I would tell jokes to people while I was around. And he said to me, he's called me Sunshine. He said, he said, Sunshine, I think you'd be real good on this thing called YouTube. And because he was in the music industry, he knew about YouTube because at the time they put music videos on. Correct. And so, I was like, what is that? He's like, it's kind of new, but just try it. Put a video on there. And I said, what would I talk about? He said, talk about, ooh, talk about when we went out last night. We had gone out to some club and all the men there were DL and blah, 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 blah. So he said, tell that story, tell that story. And so I didn't have a camera stand, a ring light or anything like that. So I grabbed a lamp, put it behind my little, I had a Dell laptop and I put on the iron board. I had my Dell laptop and I put on an ironing board because the ironing board was kind of, I love what least kind of. Yeah. And then filmed it with this big old shadow behind me at the lamp in front of me. And I told the story and it was funny. And so I think I got like maybe 10,000 views that first day. And I was like, wow, people are willing to watch me, you know? And so that inspired me to keep going to realize that um, he helped shape me a lot. He says, you know what you are? He says, you're funny, you're a storyteller, but you are good at advice. He says, so no matter what you do, it needs to be funny, be a story or be advice. You wow. always keep that in mind. And I always kept that in my mind. And over the years, as we start to be able to make income through social media, when they start monetizing things, I, you know, got more structure to it. And it's, but it's really it's still the same brand that it was all those years ago. Funny right. stories or advice. That's, that's, that's amazing because like when the internet and YouTube and everything was like fresh and new, right? Like uh, we started our podcast uh, 13, 14 years ago at this, at, at this point. And it was like everything was new. There was no real structure or format. Mm -mm. People were just out here. They didn't know how to put stuff up on iTunes. We had to figure that out on yeah. our own. Like, yeah, we like, like we really, you like, you brought up the ironing board. Mm -hmm. We used to, we used to have a a microphone mm -hmm. that we set on the desktop speakers that we would use the desktop computer speakers. And so, if we had a guest, they would basically be on Skype on the phone. It's like a conference call is what the audience was hearing at the time. Oh. Yes, yeah, so we would turn the speakers in yes, so that they could hear. We didn't have the radio technology mm -hmm. like an NPR or anything, but we just kind of made it work. Right. But but it's that kind of innovation, though, that is, is so interesting because, one, Black people, we be innovating. We have um, to. Because <laughs> I know at that time, we were definitely one of the first podcasts to have guests mm -hmm. like, that weren't in the room with, with us. You. Um, but also, it's the fact that... Um, how you said the brand hasn't changed after all those times. It's so interesting because that is what people come into the game now looking for. Like, what, what is my purpose going to be? What is my structure going to be? And then the hit on all three things right out the gate, like funny, boom, storytelling, boom, uh, advice, boom. And to still be able to do that, like, are you, does it ever, is it a thing where it ever gets like, you're like, man, I, I should mix it up or I'm getting tired of it. Have you ever experimented over those years with different things? Yeah, you know, I've experimented. I mean, when I started out, it was just inspirational stories. I had a couple years where my erotic storytelling did extremely well, which was very different than anything I'd ever done. I even toured with that. Um, you know, we did 
you know, the series and everything like that. So I've experimented with different forms of storytelling, different forms of humor, different forms of inspiration. But ultimately, it was always within those three lanes. It was just the packaging or the production I experimented with. And I think the thing for me was this, was I recognized that as a Black gay man on camera, there were only but so many spaces that people were going to be willing to advance me. And at least when I, when I was in LA, it was always, well, you know, we could put you in this, but do you know how to do hair? Do you know how to do makeup? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? It, those are honorable things to do, but I'm not gifted in those areas. I can't give, I can't do a queer eye makeover on anyone. I buy my clothes on Amazon half the time. I don't know what to tell you what to wear, you know? And so <laughs> for me, I'm just like, you know, I, I realized that these are the lanes that I fit in. And right. I, I have a belief that, it's my goal to focus on what I say, find what you do best and find other people to do the rest. I mm. found what I do best and I focus in on that. That's dope. And then like, there's some benefit to it. And, and like, it sucked that people weren't like able to see like, okay, here's your strengths. Let, we gotta, we gotta work with you. We gotta put you on something. But in a way it kind of creates like its own independence. Cause you can't really depend on them to give you a space. So right. you make your own space. And now Looking around, everybody wants their own space. I'm, you know, I've, I'm watching. It's interesting being like independent media over the years, because you know you pay attention to what trends and what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the mm -hmm. things I'm noticing now, people that are working in typically um, classical media spaces, like, uh, like say, say you're a sports person, you work on ESPN, you're MSNBC, you're a broadcaster. They're all trying to get into our lane. Yes. Like, all these they're people are trying, they're they're trying podcasts, to find a way to be like. They're on YouTube pages. Yeah. But, it, but financing it themselves. Yeah, it's and interesting like, and to like, watch. And like finding a way to branch off. Because I, I personally think, particularly with a lot of kind of the black and the brown and the other people, I personally think that people are getting tired of hitting these ceilings. People are getting tired of they want to do these projects and they want to do things that present it on a larger platform, but it's always a wall. It's always somebody to tell you, no, it's always somebody to tell you that the masses don't want to hear it. And also I think that they see a lot of independent people making money. It might not be as much, but they have freedom that they don't have. And so you they don't got to split it. Right. You ain't got to <laughs> split it. You ain't got to cut it. You know, you're your own boss, which is his own thing. But if you're willing to be your own boss, you can get the rewards that come with it too. Everybody always talk about the downfalls, and which there is, but there's a lot of reward with having the ability to say, no, we're not doing that. Because I, I just think people see the freedom. You know, like MJ curses. There's so there's mm -hmm. people on your TV right now. They curse, but they know not. To, they can't do it on TV. No, they can't. And and they see that. And there's a little bit of like, man, I wish I was doing that. You know, when I watch like, for example, Shannon Sharp and Stephen A. Smith, who are legacy like sports media. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing YouTube shows with Cat Williams. Right now they're talking about dating. They're talking about sex, and it's like. Watch, look at y'all coming over here. Look at y'all. Like, this mm -hmm. is so, there's something that, like, you were so far ahead of the curve. Right. The curve is coming to you, you now, you know, TikTok and all this stuff, influencer culture. That's, that's where you started and that's where they're trying to get to. So, I mean, you know, it's just kind of dope. And now you're, you've written a book. Um, yes. First of all, how hard is it to write a book? Because that yes, seems that's very good. difficult. Yes, it does. It is extremely time consuming. It's extremely time consuming. As first, you got to structure your ideas, then it's the actual process of putting the book together. And then there's the, the editing reviews where you know you got multiple people going through it to tell you their input. You should change this, you should change that. So you got to go through that process. And then if you do an audible an audio book, which I do recommend now because a lot of people prefer that. Um, then it's recording that, um, which is its own process. So it's a process. Um, I'll be honest with you and say, I didn't want to do it. When they first came to me to ask me to be open to do a book, I said no. And they came back to me a year later. And I said, yes, that point in time, because my logic was, do I really want to put this much time into something? And I'm not the biggest reader. I'm more of a YouTube video watcher, more of an audio, audio book listener. And so to me, I'm like, well, I underestimated how many people value um, books. But I do think that if you're a creator of any kind, if you're a public speaker of any kind, I do think that there's benefits to having a book, even if it's a tiny book, because there is a certain level of access to PR opportunities, 
that seem to open up when you have that book. And I've heard that before, but to experience it, I do think it helps your brand. And you don't have to go through a major publisher. It's great if you can, but if that's not your path, self-publishing also can open those doors as well. Mm. Um, and also like with you having been in the game this long, you had to live your life in front of your audience too. Oh, so like, yes. What yeah, and and like you know, I think now people now that social media is ubiquitous, more people we kind of know the score, but back then we didn't necessarily know the score, right? So, like you had to deal with people's like opinions on your life and their like reactions to your opinions and stuff like that. What what has that been like? And is it something you ever like got are you used to it now? Have you erected like your barriers and the stuff? And you're like, all right, I got it, you know. I have not gotten used to things. I, that's not anything I've ever gotten used to. I'm an introvert, you know, and if I'm being 100% trans, 100% transparent with you, I don't really care for the experience of walking out, people knowing my face. I don't really like that. I'm not, it's not a flattering experience for people to come up to me and want to take a picture. I, I honored, I've never said no, I'm always friendly, but it's not something I'm like, ooh, that's an ego boost. I don't feel right. that. Um, and so for me, um, I think I was a bit naive when I came into it because I didn't know it would be this popular. I was just doing a video on an iron board, you know, right. and over time it just grew and grew. And so I feel really blessed that I've been able to build this platform and I feel very grateful for that. And no matter what discomfort I feel at times, I feel very blessed by it. Mm -hmm. But even within your blessings, you can still have areas that you're like, okay, huh, I got to yeah. learn to deal with this part. So what I tell people is if you want to come into this whole social media digital space and you have a purpose, then you will be able to tolerate and work with the fame, the positives and the negatives of it because you're focused on the purpose. If you're coming into it only for the fame, my recommendation is that you do it in such a way where you can make a lot of money. Because mm -hmm. if that fame turns out to be something that you don't like dealing with, you're going to need that money to insulate yourself from some aspects of it. And it can be very expensive to insulate yourself from those aspects of fame. So just think very carefully before you put yourself in a position to have lots of people know your face. Yeah. When was the first time somebody recognized you like out in public? Because, you know, you just live your day to day life. The first time somebody was like, hey, I know you. Mm -hmm. Like, 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 how did you respond to that? Because I know it varies per person because you're just living your normal life. Then all of a sudden you begin to get recognized. And that's not normal for most people unless you have some form of intimate relationship. I went to school with you, a college, you know, yeah. something, work, something. Mm -hmm. But just people just just like, hey, I know you and you're going down your roller decks and you're like, I don't, I don't think I know you. Right. It was it was probably about 10 or so years ago. Um, and what happened was people would come up. So I learned what, what, how people do it. Most, for the most part, they don't come up screaming and saying, it's you sometimes. But for the most part, what they do is they say, do I know you from somewhere? And sometimes they're trying to figure out. Sometimes that's just their way in. And so when that would happen, I would be like, mm, I didn't know that's why they were coming to me. So I was like, mm, I don't know. Do you? And I'd be trying to go through, what, what church do you go to? Where you live? I'm trying to figure it out with them. <laughs> and my mother was with me a lot because my mother helped me with my brain. She was kind of the person behind the scenes for a long time. And so um, she finally said to me one day, I remember we're at the National Harbor outside of DC and someone had come up to me and she said, are you comprehending what's happening? I was like, no. And she says, people know who you are. And she's like saying this with my face, like looking at me like this. And I was like, really? She's like, yes, these people know who you are. You, you are achieving some level of fame. And so I think when that sunk in for me, I was like, wow, it was surreal. But I'll tell you what, it kind of flipped it for me. Because at first it's like, oh, okay. But I think that where it kind of made me shrink inward a little bit, to be quite honest, I became more introverted as a result of it, was I remember I was living in LA. I just moved to LA. So this had to have been maybe eight years ago or something like that. And I was walking down Wilshire Boulevard, not too far from the Grove, and a car drove by me. The man looks out the window, kind of felt a little creepy. And then he drove back around and he's riding slow down the sidewalk right beside me, looking at me like this. I'm like, this is so scary. Am I going to have to run? Am I going to have to grab a stick and beat his ass? What am I going to have to do? And so I'm like trying to go through this in my mind. And he's like, you that dude from online, right? Uh huh. And then that's when it kind of was kind of weird for me. So I was like, I don't always know people's intentions. Right. right? 
And so I went into therapy. I did. I went to therapy to learn how to cope with my new reality um, because right. this is a new reality mm -hmm. and like not normal. Not mm -hmm. necessarily bad. This is not normal. So I, I found a therapist. I did a lot of research and I found a therapist in L.A. who specifically worked with people who have newfound fame and mm -hmm. learned how to process it, learned how to make the adjustments within my own life so that I can live within this experience as a blessing rather than living in this experience as a constant challenge. Right. Yeah, yeah I know um, like the first few times we got recognized out places, um, it, it is a little startling because it's kind of like, uh, like you said, you're trying to place like, did you go to school or whatever? Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, for, fortunate for us, it's been mostly, you know, a really positive experience. You had some pretty dope fans out there. Um, I, I remember we were walking out the street looking for a restaurant one time, and a guy jumped out of the front door of, the rest of a restaurant and goes, Rod and Karen. We were like, what, what's happening? <laughs> what's going, we was like, going that's up. Yes. Yeah, but uh, so, like, it, you know, it, like you said, it's really more about mentally adjusting to it. Cause it's mm. gonna, it's, I mean, hopefully it's gonna happen as a byproduct or whatever you do. Um, yeah. But what about like the online interactions? Because I think um, one, especially being on the internet, when when social media stuff first started, I feel like it was a little. Everyone was naive to it, good and right. bad, right? It was Just good and know. bad, you know. That's why it's why new episodes of Catfish don't hit because we like, ah, you ain't know. But, but the first, right. <laughs> the first season, I was like, oh, oh there's yes. some people out there. It was well, must watch TV. Yeah, we're all yes. we're all jaded now. But back in the day, you know, like um the you you get the YouTube comments. I think also before like things got so politicized or polarized, right? People people would check in the content a little with a little bit more like, oh, let me see what's going on on this channel, as opposed yeah. to like I already came with my preconceived notions and opinions and stuff. So like, have you experienced that change or uh, over the years of the internet? Yeah, I definitely feel like I've experienced over the years, people have become more vitriolic online. They, you know, there's some people where their intention when they go online and write a comment is to be hurtful towards whoever they're writing that comment. That is their intention. There's nothing else within their intention. And so one of the things I've had to learn to do, because people say, well, just don't read them. How the fuck are you not going to read a comment that's under your, it just doesn't work like that, you know? Right. And so... I use those hidden words features a lot where we have thousands of them in there. You know, it, it, people are not that creative with their insults. So right. certain words, we just, those, so we don't even see those comments. Um, you know, for my actual business, you know, anything that comes into me through email, I don't see that immediately. So that goes through um, someone who reads the emails for me. So they have permission to not send me that stuff. I don't need to see someone's feedback about that. I don't need to see that you didn't like my hair that day or you didn't like my whatever. That's not really important yes. to me. Um, right. And so I've learned to insulate myself. But also the biggest thing I could do was to talk to my friends. So I remember I had a friend who he felt it was his job to whenever he saw a meme created about me or see anything about me, send me this. Did you see this? And so finally what I had to tell him was this. I said, within our friendship, I'm looking for a place of peace. Right. I'm not looking to bring me the dog to bring the bone. And so with that understood, do not ever bring me anything that you've seen about me online. If it's important enough, trust and believe I will see it or someone within my organization will see it. You only bring to me topics that are related to our friendship because for me, you're disturbing the sacred space of our friendship when you bring the outside stuff in. Yes. And he's and, and it and like also, you know, because I found that too, like um there's been times online where like people had something like Something we said on a podcast, a viral tweet, something, you know, and it's a bunch of strangers that, that don't know me and they're saying stuff that they wouldn't say to me if we were like in person. Mm -hmm. And it used to get to me really bad. But once again, it was solace in like friendships and relationships offline that really helped me too. Cause it was like, uh, one, the thing is like, if something is bothering me that I've seen online and I bring it to you as a friend, that's a much safer transaction, right? Cause I'm like, Yo, this crazy thing happened to me. And normally that person is like, that was a crazy thing. Yeah. As opposed to them being like, did you see what they said? You? you know, like I don't like I'd rather you, I'd rather <laughs> bring it to you and we can key key about it. And I think um, uh, but I think a lot of people are doing that because that was what I was saying also about the vitriol on the internet. It's gotten toxic a lot for like everybody. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's like, like I think there was a time where it was like, well, if you're famous on the internet, it's bad. Now it's just like if you on the internet. <laughs> 
it's bad. Yeah, you know? like if you if you just there and uh, Roger brought up a a great point because, like I say, we interact very very differently online. And over the years, I have kind of cut back how I interact online. Period. And what people fail to realize, famous or not famous, unless it's a bot, the other person on the side of that post is a person. Yeah, they got feelings and emotions and insecurities, all types of things flowing through their brains. And people have a tendency to forget that part sometimes. And so uh, I am very grateful for my husband because like, and I know the fans don't mean no harm and I'm better at it than I used to be because words mean things to me. So, and the thing about the internet, when something is posted and you read it, I can't hear your tone. I don't know what your intent is. Like, like a lot of times, like, like all, all the, all that context is stripped, and I'm old, so I like to know these things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it would be times, and like I said, I am not as bad as I used to be. It would be times where I would literally look at Roger and I would be going off, and I'm like, "What the fuck is this?" And he'd be like, <laughs> "And on top of that, I don't be knowing the slang or none of that East shit either." So Roger B has to explain to me, this is what they meant. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I was the person that would more than likely be the one to reply to someone. But Karen would, she'll be like, oh, no, I don't reply to people. And then people are like, oh, because she, she's more mature. She knows how to handle it. I'm like, no, Mm-mm. she cussing at me. She's talking. <laughs> I'm, not, she's I'm talk- not putting online. Yeah, she's doing all the cussing in person. And y'all just don't know behind <laughs> the scenes what it's like. She's mad, too. Yes, because uh-huh. you're human. But but I think it's, human. Yeah, I think it's also like a. There's like a, a callous you get a little bit. There's like, you know, it's like I've been here before. I think um, when I was in therapy too, I think it also helped me to see like how much people's stuff is not about you. Right. You know, so like if you give some, this this is a big thing on TikTok and, and stuff now. You give some advice, right? And mm-hmm. someone's in a situation where it wouldn't apply to them specifically. And then it's like the reply, you know, it's like, hey, I made carrot cake. And they're like, I'm allergic to carrots. It's like, I'm not. I'm no longer offended by that. That is just now a like. Oh, so you have some problem somewhere, and I'm sorry that that happened to you. But if for people that eat carrots, this is this is the recipe. You know what I mean? Yes. We have to. You, you. <laughs> you do, and I, I I like that you mentioned about it thickens your skin. And to me, at this point, you know, and I'm sure for you both as well, when you put yourself out there for so long. You will get a thicker skin after a yes. while. And the process of thickening is not always easy. But at this point in time, I have a thicker skin. If I see something that I don't like, you know, well, my solution, delete the comment. If you, if you don't want it, the comment doesn't ex- have to exist. This isn't the morning post. Everyone doesn't deserve to have their editorial on my post. And wow. so, you know, I, you know, delete it, ignore it, whatever it may be, move on. Uh, one of the things that my therapist told me years ago was she said, I want you to picture someone living in the most just horrible circumstances, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, whatever. Picture them sitting in that life, miserable, just just miserable, and picture that that's the person who sat and wrote that comment to you. And I said, well, why picture that? She said, because anyone who goes out of their way to try to harm someone emotionally that they don't know, you know, just because they watch it, it doesn't mean they know you, right? I, they, they go out of their way to try to harm you, probably is someone who is hurting in some part of their life. Happy people don't yeah. do that. So Mm-mm. the physical manifestation of how they look. And sometimes like, okay, well, that's that's easy enough. And I had to teach my nephews the same thing because they came into fame at like 17 years old. Right. And so teaching them how to navigate that was one of the things I taught them. Yeah, and these kids now, like, they grew up with the internet. Like, right. for me and Karen, like, we had a good 15, 20 years where it's like, Oh, you're weird if you're on the computer on the internet. No one's oh, doing yeah. that. You're oh. weird. What you date no line for? Like yeah, it, it, exactly. you couldn't perceive that was those weird things. back then. Now everybody's doing it. So, like, you know, like with my niece and stuff, she's barely online. I think that's because the the kids, the kids are over it. Like the kids are less like they're like, uh, why would I tell the internet that? You know, where I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I, I feel old because I'm the one that's like, oh, let's let's show them my outfits for Christmas. They're like, well, why? We got the outfits, we right here. Yeah. <laughs> It, they've learned to live with it and have some boundaries. I have um, one of my nephews is, uh, although he has a social media presence, he barely checks his page ever. I said, you don't check your social media? He's like, no. He's like, I do it since the world knows I exist. But like, 
<laughs> like, I don't go on that side. Yeah. You completely said it's like like it's fairy tale land, like it's not real. It's like whatever. I don't go out there. They really and be like so, proof of life. You know what I'm saying? Like they post just to be like, hey guys, still alive. See you in six months. I'm like, how can you even have the discipline to do that? Because I'm gonna be on there scrolling, <laughs> liking stuff and replying, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um, so also uh would you give an advice like when did you realize you had a penchant for advice? Was it because other people told you the advice was good? Or was it like, you know, were you just giving advice to your friends and they were like, man, you need to sell this shit? Like, how did how you figure it out? I think, well, because I've always been very, very pragmatic, even as like a six-year-old, I was very pragmatic. Um, I could always kind of just cut right through it and say, hey, why don't you try that? And so throughout my life, I, if there were two things I knew to be true about myself, I knew that I was funny, that people generally laughed at me when I spoke um, in a positive way. And I knew that people generally valued what I had to say if they asked my opinion. I didn't know that that could be turned into a business in any way, but I did know that, okay, you know, my thoughts are coming to me in that way. And, you know, I don't know what everyone's belief system is, but, you know, I was raised um, a Christian. And so for me, I believed that, and I still do believe, that that is my gift. I think that your gift is the way, I always say your gift is the way that your creator embodies him or herself within you. And for me, the way that my creator embodies him or herself within me is through giving me insight that happens to be helpful for a lot of people. Now, I also saw on your website that you've been endorsed by Oprah and Tabitha Brown. What, like, what is that like how did what is that? Did you meet that, them? That stamp did of you, approval. Did you did, did did they just see you online? And they were like, oh my god, y'all need to listen to this brother. Like how how did that work? Well, for Oprah, I met her at an event and she was just fabulous and was and gave me the opportunity to share my story and share my business. For Tabitha, you know how I came across Tabitha. Um, because this is in no way to take away from Oprah, but I say if there's a tap, if there's an Oprah of our generation, it's Tabitha Brown. I love mm -hmm. Yes, Tabitha. it is. I love Tabitha. Yeah, I, love I agree. Tabitha. And um, my mother, this was years ago, my mother was watching Tabitha and Tabitha's brand was growing really fast, but she wasn't where she is at this time. And so my mother's like, there's this woman online. She's, she talks about vegan food a lot. Um, you should, you should, you should watch her. I have her on your platform or something like that. Cause I like her a lot. And so I didn't, I, at the time I didn't watch her. And so I looked her up and managed to find her email address online someplace. Cause at this point, Tabitha was growing, but her email was online. So I sent her an email. I said, hi, my name is MJ Harris. My mother recommended you. I was very transparent. I said, my mother recommended them that I speak with you and see if we could film together. And she says, I know who you are. Here's my phone number. And so um, I called her up. And at the time, we probably lived about 15 minutes from each other, just by coincidence. And she came over to my house and we um, filmed two or three videos together over the course of like the next um, couple months. And Tabitha has been... An amazing, in the industry we throw around the world, friends, but that's my friend, that's my friend. Tabitha is not someone that I called to say, how, how was your day? I mean, that's not our, our experience. But she has been someone who has been an industry sister to me. And what I mean by that is that there have been times where I've been offered to do something or offered a deal. And I have no context around, am I being paid fairly? Is this fair? Right. And I can call her up and I'll say, hey, you know, just quick question for you. Is this fair? You know, I don't even know when you did X, Y, Z, you ain't got to tell me your exact numbers, but would you have accepted this? And she can tell me, well, yes, that is, or consider this or consider that. Or I remember when I need to hire a lawyer years ago because I was growing and I needed someone to help me with reviewing contracts. She says, oh, call this person. She has been, she's never been a gatekeeper. What you see in Tabitha online is exactly who she is. She is that sincere, that kind, that wonderful. And, um, and I just sing her praises because I can say that although when she started out, you know, my platform was bigger than hers. Now her platform is way bigger than mine. But even within that transition of experience, she has remained solid and just wonderful to me. And I am truly grateful for her. And I celebrate her success. And I want her to become as big as humanly possible. Oh, you know? yeah, man. I watched, uh, we, well, we used to watch Compli uh, Compliplated. I oh, think that was the name of the show. show on Food Network. On Food Network. Mm -hmm. And I love the show. And me then too. there was like behind the scenes stuff. They was trying to change tabs. I was like, oh, oh, cancel. Get out of here, Food Network. We're not messing <laughs> with y'all. I don't want to see nothing over there no more. <laughs> right. like, I don't mess with Tabitha like that. She just, she just seems to have such like a dope energy. 
You know what right. I mean? Like, and especially, I think a lot of people glommed on to her because it was especially at a time where like so much stuff was vitriolic. So yeah. much stuff was like a hot take or like a mean thing or something. And I I remember like the first videos on like TikTok of her just being like, hey, have a good day. And people were like, oh yeah, I just want a good day, man. <laughs> it's COVID outside. Yeah. They, they killing people. I just, yeah, thank you. I feel like I got to share this. Somebody <laughs> need to see what is happening. Now, I also, I've seen your videos too. And, there, and there's a very like, uh, it's an energy there too. That's mm-hmm. like, but it's but it's more it's more intense. It's like, come on, you got the, you know the motherfuckers talking about you. Don't why you keep going down their house. So, <laughs> I'm like, I, I need this too. Love that approach. I love that approach because for me, that's how I talk to myself. So what I bring to 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 viewers is my logic is this: if I've gone through it, someone else has gone through it. If I'm going through it, someone else is going through it. There's nothing new under the sun. And so I can tell you, even earlier, um, early, well, yesterday, I had woken up and I saw an email that I didn't like. It was nothing major. It was an email that I didn't like. And I was like, oh, gosh, I had to deal with the X, Y, Z today, whatever it was. And I literally said to myself, I was like, hold the fuck up. Hold the fuck up. You are sitting in Bangkok right now, visiting with your nephew, son, that you have raised to be financially independent to the point where he can live in another country. You are able to travel the world. You know, your life looks like this. You're happy, blah, 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 blah. Why the fuck are you going to let this ruin your morning? Response to God, I'm ta- this is how I talk to myself as I'm brushing my teeth. I talk to myself in a way that empowers me to be able to transform my mindset quickly. And so I bring that to the audience. I know that on social media, I really only have barely 15 seconds of your time to capture your attention and change your mindset. So the only way I know how to do that is I know how to do that through being very direct and in your face. Yeah. And I see the like comments. I know people got to be sharing it because it, because it really is like the kind of thing I was like, I'm waking up this morning. I need to hear this. Appreciate you. I, I'm going to go to the gym or whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I like that energy. And then like to translate that into to a book, like mm-hmm. what were the topics that you wanted to broach in the book? Uh, once again, get the fuck out of your own way. I got it to letting go of the shit that's holding you back. What were like the, the like when you started outlining it, what were the things you were like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about that. I was thinking initially about what are the biggest topics that have transformed my life. So learning not to be a people pleaser, learning not to be afraid of rejection, learning how to say no, excuse me, learning how to set boundaries. What were the big things that were the biggest challenges for me to overcome, but I got the greatest rewards out of actually doing it? Because again, my logic is if it affected me or is affecting me, then it's probably affecting other people. And I think that that's one of the mistakes that a lot of creators, authors, whoever make is that they try to do content based on what they think is going to help the audience rather than doing content based on what's actually helping them. I think that if you can see yourself as your own focus group, that's a great starting point because if it touches you, it's probably going to touch somebody else. Right. Yeah. And also I think it makes people more relatable because one of the things I think that can, uh, at least for me, that turns me off from advice is the people that give advice because it's like, I'm perfect and I'm going to give you some advice because I'm better than you and you need to hear this as opposed to like, I'm going through the shit too, guys. Uh, you know, here's what works for me, you know, here's what helped me out. And I think that's much more relatable. Did you have like inspirations for like the book and for just like your general online personality? You know, my, my nephew asked me this question yesterday. He's like, he's like, "Uh, who, who inspired you? Like who, where did you get your persona from online from? And I had thought about it because I watched a ton of self-help stuff growing up. You know, I, I grew up in the church. I'd, I'd be watching, you know, uh, T.D. Jakes. Uh, it was, was it Joyce Myers? Like all those folks, they came on in the morning as I was getting ready for school, you know, on like BET, they would come on in the morning. And so I would say probably the biggest inspiration for me, and I don't talk about her enough, but she did inspire me a lot. There's a woman named Joyce Meyer. She's oh. a white woman from the Midwest. I and I remember watching her as a kid. And what I liked about her was that she was so straightforward and so direct. She was never hurtful, but mm-hmm. very, very direct and straightforward. And I said to myself, I said, if ever I were to do something like that, I, I had an inkling maybe that it could happen. If ever I did something like that, I want to be very straightforward. I want how I want to be like her. And I don't think that I consciously did it, but in retrospect, I look back and I'm like, oh, I kind of do embody that of just it's right there. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be imperfect right in front of you, but we're gonna get through this journey together. Right. Um, did what there I know you've given like relationship advice as well with 
the I don't know if you've seen you had to have seen this. Everyone's seen this. Oh, the ubiquitousness of these like gender war like skits. Like it's mm-hmm. just like I can't imagine yeah. they're real because they're so some of them are so ridiculous. I'm sure yeah, some so are real. The restaurant that, that was when yeah. I saw last week. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know, oh uh uh I can't go to the cheesecake factory because it's that's where all the poor people eat or whatever, you know, like um <laughs> Does that stuff like give you like inspiration to do more advice? Is it are you do you just roll your eyes and laugh at it like we do? Do you like what are you doing with that stuff? Well, you know, I watch content just like everybody else. I'm sitting up in my bed at night scrolling on the platforms, watching everything, just like everybody else. Um, so sometimes it's entertaining um to me. Sometimes it definitely gives me a sense of what people are experiencing and thinking about because being such an introvert. You know, I need to be able to understand what people are going through because my day to day life, I talk to the same five people every week. You know, I don't really have a circle, you know, around me. So that's helpful in that way. But I think that ultimately, when it comes down to it, is I've never been good at, and I've tried, I've never been good at trying to give advice just on something that's trending because I don't think that the advice comes across as authentic for me. You know, and so I just kind of stick within the lane that I talk about things that are authentic to me that I've experienced or that I've had such deep conversations with people about that I'm like, okay, I get that experience. Now I think I can talk about it on your behalf. So I enjoy it, but it doesn't necessarily influence my content one way or the other. Yeah, I I agree too, because like with the trending stuff, what I find is that people have to do a lot of projection to make it work for them you know the, the simone bowser and her husband do like a podcast someone clips 45 seconds people spend three weeks just being like uh, he's a narcissist he's an abuser and i'm like i don't know these people they looked happy but i actually don't know right there's other cases where people you know uh look unhappy and been together for 70 years i listen it ain't i don't know them people They're, those are some famous strangers <laughs> but you know, I, I did one of the simone biles um podcast and i'll tell you why I chose to do it was because I see content every single day, like everybody else. But if I see something that resonates with me and I'm like, Ooh, I have my own reaction as a viewer. Right. Yeah. But most viewers just comment in the comments and keep it moving. Well, I've got a platform. So rather than comment in the comments, I'm going to make a video about it. And so for me, when I saw that, I remember watching it and I was thinking to myself, I didn't care for the way that he spoke about his wife in terms of, I didn't appreciate the way he told the story about it. Um, at that time. And so I chose to do a video about it, but I did one on that. I did one on, um, what was it? The Kiki Palmer's um, yeah. situation where her um, partner had posted what he had posted. And so I am willing to comment on things. I have to have a personal feeling about it. And I remember doing um, probably 2020 or 2021. I, at one point in time, I was worried about running out of topics. So um, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of creative talent that was available. So I had hired a woman to be my... Um, content producer to give me ideas about what to cover. And she would send me trending topics every Monday and I would do none of them because none of them resonated with me. And I realized I'm just not that type of creator. I'm not able to do that. But if something does resonate with me on a human level, I'll do something about it. Yeah. Like, and the thing for me is like, if, if we talk about something trending, at least my goal is to talk about it, like at least one level beyond just kind of like the typical things that are happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, like what I thought was interesting about the Simone Biles thing was the the way it was produced, right? Because there's an hour long podcast or whatever, but the people that did that podcast chose to give us those two minutes for a reason. Mm-hmm. Like that, like those are the two minutes they wanted us to see, yes. right? And they knew without the rest of the context of that interview where mm-hmm. they talk no, about supporting each other and a bunch of other shit. We're just gonna see a dude that seems like he's a little bit arrogant. You know what I mean? At best, mm-hmm. we're like. And, and uh, arrogant to a woman that we hold in extremely high esteem. So, like, exactly. I, that was the thing I peeped about it was like, because, you know, the, the content producers came out later and were like, we didn't think it would happen. And I was like, I don't know no, if there's a way to yeah, not think that would happen. Is, you had an hour worth of stuff you could have chopped up. You could have shared that you- time that she had the, the um she had the twisties and she couldn't perform at the Olympics. And he supported her through that and mm-hmm. helped her get, like, her confidence back and, and all this you could have shared that moment. That's a sweet moment. It wouldn't have went as viral, but it would have been right. like, oh, man, I really like that relationship. But you didn't want us to feel like that. You want us to feel like, who the hell this man think he is? 
and I'm and so like mission accomplished, right? But I, if if that was that's the way that I like to talk on yeah. the trending topics when we talk about like the cheesecake factory thing, we we like to break down like is the acting good? You know, like what's going that's on with this camera angle? About. You know, is, did this really happen? You know, <laughs> like, you know what I, you know I think about is when I see content online that is produced. Right. It's, yeah. it's obviously produced and everything like that. And I see people in the comments, like the whole thing where they were at the dinner and, the, and they were saying that the man should pay for the woman's yeah. friends or whatever. OK, it's rather it's produced or not. People were writing in the comments. This is the skit. This is the skit. And I'm thinking, who gives a fuck this is a skit? The point of it is <laughs> there's a point that's being embodied here. Like, you know, this is not this is you all are not, you know, arbiters of people's acting skills. <laughs> What your job is is to watch this and find does it resonate with you? Have you been through an experience right. like this? What's your opinion on this dynamic? And so to me, I mean, I've been in social media for a long time. You know, you do content that's going to be produced in order to deliver a point. You do content that's very raw in that moment. You get both. And what I, I how I've always thought of it is like this: is I say that I think that sometimes we hold social media creators to a very different standard than we hold TV creators to. Because I'm like, people yeah. will watch these reality shows. I'm not going to name them. But they will watch these reality shows that are hyper produced, that I'm not going to say they're directly scripted, but they're very guided and everything like that, heavily edited, characterized and everything like that. And they will sit up here and be like, yes, yes, yes. But then they see content online that seems a little scripted and now they want to rip it to shreds. And I'm like, everything you're watching is produced to some extent because we all have to and, and educate you. Right. That is a valid That is a valid point that I hadn't thought about. I, I, I do like to point that out that there's skits because that's why I find the humor in it is to be like yeah. was like the decisions that were made you know uh like oh you started filming exactly at the second that they yeah. smoked <laughs> yeah like yeah because like you know because <laughs> you know in real I feel like in real life I always like if I had to like if I was responsible for like recording the altercations that happened in my life so that I could put on the internet I, I swear to God, y'all wouldn't know mine are real because I'd always start like three minutes into the fight. Like, oh, man, hey, man, I got to explain to y'all what happened. So first of all, he hit my car, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I never would get it perfect, but they always nope, get it perfect. Never but, get it perfect. But that is a good point. In a world where people know reality TV is basically scripted, why why do you even care to be scripted? You just want to fight about the topic anyway. So, right, this is how so they just fight. The topic. Oh, man. Yeah, so I mean, it doesn't bother me. And I think just because I spent so long in that whole Hollywood universe of things. Um, I think it's just always been my general expectation that if it's on a camera, it's produced to some extent. You know, yeah, no one's going to put the worst take out there. And if you did film something and it was really bad, why wouldn't you just redo that and make yeah. it something that's going to deliver the impact that you want? And so I've always been very open about, you know, my view on that. But I get it that, you know, from a viewer perspective, what, what I've learned is that what viewers want is they don't necessarily want it to be real. They just want it. They don't want you to remind them that it's not. Yes. Real. Yes. You see, yes. they want to criticize the quality, real. not the intention. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they want to look. They want to fight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, just don't get in the way. Okay. All you got to do is bring up something to fight about. Who's going to pay for this check? Okay. Well, here we go. This this what's gonna happen. Like, I, that's what's going to happen. Romy, what did you all have on that? I'm, I'm interested. What opinion well, did you I all have in that situation? So we have a segment on the show called Gender Wars, right? Okay. We have a song and everything. And we play those, like, those, those clips that people send us. People have sent me this clip, like, 50 times. All right? If, y if you're on Instagram listening right now, don't send a DM. I, I got it. We just haven't had time to cover it yet. Oh, so we have so we haven't even watched it. But uh it is it is a man that actually, you know, y'all want to do one live? Y'all want to do yes. a gender war live? I would like to. All right, let me pull up the music real quick. I got you. Yeah, um, games. Yay! <laughs> I like games. Uh and then I'll go to my Instagram and see if I can find a DM. <laughs> We're going to war. Gender war. There's a war going on outside. There's a war going on outside. All right, let me see if I can find this. There is so people have sent this up. Oh, yeah, it's the first damn yeah, one. Say, you know I. Oh my god, seen it. you guys, y'all, y'all love this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally like my first DM. Uh, all right, let me put it on the chat. All okay. right, and then I'm gonna turn on the volume and see if I can get. Man, it. I can say what. Well,
Oh, I guess you can't turn it down on Instagram. So it's going to be loud as hell, everybody. Just give me one second. Ah! To, and then I'll, I'll just play the sound. this loud ass thing. Uh, here we go. I got the birthday girl and my wife. Separate. 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 Are you the only man at this table? Why are we doing separate tags? It's all women here. No, but I'm not. I'm not responsible for paying everybody. I got the birthday but girl. You invited everybody. You invited all of us. I didn't invite you, <laughs> but I didn't sign up for that. Okay, there's nobody else doing but the. You participate. I know we got it. I don't. I don't care how y'all do it. Well, I'm sorry. I Dave, but something. you always pay. Like you're the only man at the table. You no, have to pay the taxes. But I, I don't, I'm not obligated. I got my whole family. It's $700 for this whole table, and it's my birthday. You know, this, is, this is your podcast, Coco. This is your best It's only $700. Friend. It's only fans. You being cheap. Are you, you kidding cheap? me right you now? You're being cheap right now. Okay, first. No, if that was the case, I would have just, I would have just took you out. Are you being cheap? Dre, are you going to let him sit here with a whole table full of women? I really feel like... It's not having responsibility, and when y'all get a husband, I'm married. I'm married. I'm sorry. I have a husband. I do have a husband, though. Hold on, wait a minute. Thank y'all. 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 Thank Okay, okay, all right. Okay, that, that went further than I thought it was going to go. Uh, the, now, the first thing I want to say, I want to give a shout out to the production. I actually think this is a really good, good production. This is good production. Like, yeah, yeah like, I, I love the energy. We always it brought me, about, it brought me in. I felt like moment. I was at the table. Yeah. Yes. Like, like, oh, wow, he not paying, you know. Um, Now, the obvious to me, I think it's obvious. You don't know somebody's financial situation. You don't. Seven hundred dollars is a relative, like uh, it's nothing to some people. It's something to me. <laughs> okay, that's a car note. That's that's a bill. That's a bill. Bill. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't know where they live. I don't know how they get down. Maybe they know more about that man's pockets than me. But I ain't never left the house assuming I can run up seven hundred dollars or anything, and somebody got it. I <laughs> like that's in, uh, just in general with like dinners and that type of etiquette my belief system and the way i've just been raised is if you're gonna go somewhere to spend money make sure you have enough to cover yourself just in case right. it would be That's nice true. if somebody else covers it you know we've had dinners where we've covered it we've had dinners where someone but, covered something right. but i've never expected it right just because i feel like that's not fair to that person it's an assumption correct um so I don't like to me, I feel like everyone you might have been miffed or whatever, but everybody should have been cool with like, let me just pay for my own thing. And then like if he wanna do something nice for the birthday girl, that's that's like a yeah, nice thing. Yeah, I, I, they I, turned I, this nice thing into like a terrible thing. Yes, I've been I've been at things like that where we've done that. Everybody chip in, we go to the birthday girl covered, everybody else cover their own beer. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying like like something like that. Like 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 that's not an unreasonable ass. Yeah, what was your take, MJ? Well, you know, for me, 92% of my viewers are women, which means that, that that's reflective of the DMs I get to about all numbers of topics. And mm -hmm. I will say that for me personally, I have a belief that if we live in a world where we are advocating for women to be treated equally, advocating for women to be paid equally, in a world where in a lot of cases, Black women specifically, out earn uh, um, black men um, significantly are out educated. I think that we need to come up off of these antiquated views that just because someone has a penis between their legs that they should be providing the majority of the expenses in certain circumstances. Do I think that if a man asks someone out on a date that he right. should pay? Well, maybe for that first date because he initiated right. and I think that's nice. But I personally am of the belief that just because someone's a male, that doesn't mean that you're entitled to his pockets. Right. And I also do think that what people have to think about, because this scenario was done with artistic integrity, um, yeah. of, or art liberties, I should say, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. just scenarios that have happened in real life. Right. And I think that if I invite out people to help me celebrate my spouse's birthday, I think that it is completely um, just asinine to expect that just because I made the invite that I should pay for the whole thing. I think right. that, that makes people less apt to want to invite you. So what, if, if I ever part my lips to ask, do you want to come to something? That means I'm putting the bill. 
I just think it's, I, I, you know, I, I, I just, it, to me, I hear these scenarios all the time. And I'll tell you, I received a lot of criticism when I would go online and I would say things like, you know, um, ladies, it's okay. Maybe not on the first date, but as you start the date, it's, like, it's okay to pick up the bill every now and then. It's okay to, to chip in, you know, think about, does he earn the same amount as you? If you earn more, he got bills too. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And people, oh no, mm, I'm, I'm a man, this, a man, that. And I'm like, <laughs> like like it's 1952 when it's your grandma, but your grandmother couldn't work back then. Right. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So of course, if he was the only one with income, he should pay. But some of y'all got master's degrees and three hundred thousand dollars salaries, expecting this man who doesn't have a degree at all and he makes fifty thousand dollars a year to pay for every bill and every day. Make it make yeah. sense. I always felt like, at least like with the Black history I know and reading this stuff, patriarchy has never really been for Black people. Like mm -hmm. it's like because it's. We've never had the uh, privilege, luxury, whatever you want to, white people want to call it, but we've never had that experience. The women in our lives have always been forced to work, either from economic hardship or literally just forced to work, because we was all getting forced to work for free, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, we haven't really had that experience, and um, I do understand, like, the the, the idea. I think, especially, like you said, with the first date especially, there's a level of, like, courtship and whatnot yeah. that I, I totally do get like especially if I ask you out somewhere I, then it's you know I want you to feel you know unencumbered essentially mm -hmm. but there becomes a point where it, where it is like all right man I we both know what where we at financially we both know what to expect so I could definitely understand that and um I think what messes up the equation is there's so many men um, brothers, especially that want the patriarchal entitlements, mm -hmm. but they don't want to, then they want to split the check. And it's like, you can't have both. Right. You, you, got, you yeah. know, right on that. You do. Cause I mean, I do think, and I taught my nephews that I remember one of them, um, I think he had just turned 18 at the time. And he was saying, you know, I, I want a woman that I can take care of and so on and so forth and, and all this other stuff. Uh, and I said, are you sure you want right. that? Right. And he, and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I want you to picture this. What if your income changes at some point in time and you're not able to show up in the same way financially? Are you really willing to go through what that transition looks like? Because maybe that's not what she signed up for. If you're agreeing to that type of mm -hmm. dynamic. And so what I told what I taught them was I said, choose a spouse who, even if you are showing up more financially, they are also capable of showing up. And either they can't show up financially in the same way, they can show up in other ways that are still equitable. Choose a partner, you know, so that no matter what, you both are showing up in some capacities. I think that that leads to a much healthier long-term um, yeah, arrangement. I, I, I agree. Uh, me and Roger have been married 20 years, over 20 years. And the thing about it, I've been without a job. He's been without a job. Mm -hmm. I've been beside him in the hospital. He's been beside me in the hospital. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 it's, it's, it's not. Them, people forget about the part of the vows that is like, and, because it's like in sickness. Yeah. You know, you know, like, and when you're broke and you got some money. So like, yeah, because um, to make a, a sports analogy here, it's kind of like different people's games change depending on who they're playing with. Agreed. Like what makes you what makes you a good teammate on one, with one person might make you not the right teammate for another. But I think mm -hmm. when, you sign, when you sign up to be a partner, I, I love that you said that word because mm -hmm. that is that is what I think people should look for is and, a partner. And they don't. They and don't the look for a partner. And a partnership can change dynamics. Like it, you know, it's like okay, so we're going through a lean time. It's the it's the salad days. We eating at home a lot right now. And then sometimes you have it and you like, we balling. We both balling, though. It can't be. Yeah. Not one of us is balling. Right. Oh. And, and also, yeah, and also something you brought up, which a lot of people don't understand. In the process of a partnership, that means the person in the league can rotate because it's a partnership. Yeah. One day you in front, yeah. next day I'm in front. Like, and, like if and, you ever be and, somewhere and something bad happened, like you, you at the airport, your flight get canceled, y'all supposed to both hop on a plane or whatever, only one of y'all gets to freak out. That's that's how the partnerships have to work. One of one y'all get, get to go crazy. The other person got to adjust and be like, I'll be the one to talk to the uh, to the pilot. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or really, like, we both have two different personalities. Or is Roderick's eating something and he ordered like a steak and it wasn't what he wanted. And so if it was up to him, 
he would have ate the shit he didn't I would have ate the steak. I would have me been. was like, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. Yeah. That, that is, <laughs> I, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, like you see that play out. I still love, I love the sketch or whatever we're yes. calling it. I love yeah. it because because you get to talk about those things because yeah. of it. Um, and I don't, I, I hope to God they didn't really leave that restaurant because I was like, they, uh, we, y'all child, ran out on that child, check. That'd have been an article where 15 people got arrested. Well, you know what I do? You know what I do in these in the, in the restaurant situations? Because what I've experienced is this, and I wish we stopped doing this in our community, is expecting that whoever has, whoever people believe has more financial resources at the table should be paying it the bill in general. Because I've experienced that. As time has gone along, you know, people's perceptions though, he must have more money. So when the bill come over, I start looking everywhere else and it's uncomfortable in that right. moment. And there were times where people thought I had more and I did, and there were times where they thought I had more and I didn't. And so what I learned to do is in those scenarios, um, first of all, um, when we go out to eat, if it's a big group, not like if it's a small group, if it's a bigger group, what I do is I will go, like after we've all ordered, I go to the, like I went to the restroom, and I'll go to the server and I'll say, excuse me, um, can I plate my part of the bill, please? And whoever I'm taking care of, I just go ahead and swipe in. They give me the receipt at that time. I write their tip in there. And then when the bill comes out for the overall group and everybody's putting in their cards or whatever they're waiting to put in their cards, I pull up my receipt. I say, well, I've already paid my part, so I'm just going to put that in. So, you know, yeah. y'all can go ahead and divide up. And I pull up my phone and start scrolling on social media. I'm going to just ice out the awkwardness because what I've learned is that one of the biggest things that affects us in the African-American community is this whole idea of what I call community entitlement. We believe that we're entitled to other people's abundance. And then, and that hurts us even on a family level because right. you're the child, you make some resources, but now mom or daddy is expecting you to take care of them. So you're depleting your future ability to build financial security for yeah. you and your family because you're using your abundance to take care of other people. And I want to break that generational curse for myself and my family. So I've taught them and, you know, especially my boys, I've taught them no one's entitled to your money. I don't care if you want to be with them and I are not entitled to it. You pay at the level that you're comfortable with and you have conversations to let people know what your boundaries are. Talk yeah. about it. You got to be self-reliant and also get surround yourself with some self-reliant people like, you know, flock together. Because I, I know that that vibe of like uh, you go out and the end of the check comes and everybody hands is going in a, you know, Oh man, like you said, the eyes won't, won't match. Um, but what I do is if I do plan on paying for everybody's food, I just take a bite off everybody's plate. You know, you just, <laughs> oh, oh, get some of that. don't worry, I got you. I got you. <laughs> what you got? A sandwich? You got a sandwich? Shit. That look good. <laughs> but, uh, nah, that's, that's really cool, man. Um, MJ, we've kept you for over an hour, man. We appreciate you. Thank yes. you for uh, coming by the show. Yay! Um, definitely um, go, go get the book. Mm -hmm. Get the fuck out of your own way. A God to letting go of shit that's holding you back. Make sure y'all cop that everywhere that you get books. Um, and check out his YouTube channel. I mean, y'all probably already in it. What, I posted this um, episode <clears throat> in December, like just a, like a placeholder, like, hey, we're mm -hmm. going to have MJ on. And I, I logged in this morning. There were already two comments like, oh, okay, wait. He like, and they were from December. Like, <laughs> people been waiting on this episode for a minute. Wow. Thank you for coming by. Thank you, and, uh, wish you much success. Thank All you right. so much. Yes, sir. Until